That's it. Come on, I keep you awake. Sorry, trying to make it a bit entertaining for the for the delay. Can I start? The box is uh, starting up. I'm going to show you a little video from Montreal while we're getting ready. Just uh, this is my city in Canada. You might have seen this before. It was uh, it's like VHS quality. There was a uh, some rapid snow and ice and bad timing and there's a road which is a little steep and uh, so you can see what happened. You'll tell me when uh, they're ready. You want me to start, start? Yeah. Make it a little fun. Sorry about the video. That's a LibreOffice bug. So if anyone can track down Michael Meeks. What? This is my problem. Yeah. That's the video. That's actually a LibreOffice bug. Uh, the video is fine, but LibreOffice is buggy a bit. It's pretty good, but except for that. So uh, I'll do this little. Uh, so this bus thought they could do better. Boom. Yeah. But you know, he gets away, and uh, his friend comes. Oh. Is there another microphone on? The police to the rescue. Can you turn off the feet? There's some feedback. Can you turn down my mic? Can you turn it down a little bit? But don't worry, we have City Works who can come save the issue. So, wait till the end. Okay, I gotta get going with the talk. So, uh, can you turn down the volume a tiny bit, please? Thank you, because a little feedback. So, who am I? I'm gonna talk really quickly and I'm gonna be sitting down a little bit. So, if you can't see me, don't worry, I'm still here. Listen for my voice. Um, I'm a hacker, I work on config management things. Still a little bit of feedback. Can you turn down the mic just a tiny bit, please? No, no, no. This one. No, no, no. I'll use this one because I need to type. Yeah. Anyways, any case, I don't need it. Um, I write a technical blog called The Technical Blog of James. Who's seen it? Just raise your hand. Who's seen my blog? If you haven't, just raise your hand so I seem really popular, please. Thank you. Um, I studied physiology and I'm doing this sort of DevOps thing. Um, and just a little bit of background. Is it feedback? Are you hearing feedback? Yeah. Can, can you guys turn down the microphone, please? Please? Hello? Oh boy, that's bad. Hello? Um, so just a little bit of the background. Uh, it's still. Do you have an audio control? Is the mic on the table still on? I hope not. Hello? Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how's that? Still a bit. I'll just have to talk softly. Can you hear me if I talk softly? My goodness. Uh, what's with the guys? AV guy, can you do you have a microphone control? Can you turn it down, please? Uh, we'll do the best we can. Sorry about that. So uh, every day in sort of system in life, everyone's kind of SSHing everywhere or doing this crazy YAML stuff and like to manage servers. And this is really not how we should be doing config management. Um, but like the solution to these problems, a lot of people are doing things manually. A lot of people are just pushing everything to the cloud, which is someone else's problem. And is this a good idea? Hello? Is this a good idea? Come on, wake up. This is my answer to if this is a good idea or not. It's just uh, not a good idea. So everything's just nope. And I use this image a lot because it's just my feeling about a lot of things that could be different. So uh, long time, the long story short is I got fed up with a lot of the automation tools and things out there. So I started working on my own tool called MGMT. I'm going to give you a, one really quick demo to show you how it works. And then I'm going to show you more of a history of everything going on. So um, basically, if you run the tool, we have a sort of a, a file that describes the code. And I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, just a very simple problem. It says, in this file hello world, say hello. Right? We're sort of statically declaring the state of this file. And if we run this, you can see it creates the file, hopefully. And we'll go over here. And is it big enough? You can all see, right? Um, you can see that the file is actually created as we expect. 
And this is how sort of most config management tools work today. You ask for something, create some files, install some packages, set up some users, and it does them. But MGMT is a little bit different because you can do cool things. You can move the file, and it comes right back because it's running in real time. And uh, I've shown this demo lots of times, but one more time. You remove the file and cat the file, and it comes right back. You can see MGMT sleeping. It detects when something happens, and it wakes up and, and fixes the state of the, real, of the system. Does that make sense? And just to sort of show off a little bit, and then we'll talk about other things, if I run this watch command that just runs this file over and over and over again, you can see that as fast as MGMT is running, it notices and fixes, um, fixes the state. OK? So that's sort of the future of what I want. I'm going to show you some more demos ever. Ah, my goodness. I'm going to show you some more demos uh, at the end, but I want to talk a little bit more of the state of the art. So um, I have to do some boring slides before we do live demos. So just some brief prerequisites, because this is sort of a beginner talk, and I want everyone on the same page so we can use the same terminology to talk to each other. Does that make sense? OK, so like five minutes of boring slides, and then hacking. Deal? 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 All right, cool. So just really quickly, um, a DAG is a directed acyclic, acyclic graph. And we use these a lot in automation because we want things to happen in a certain order. And graphs de describe the dependency chain. So for example, I want to install the package before I um, set up the config file and start the daemon. So that's what these are used for. That's what it's called. Um, item potents, anyone know what this means? Um, the idea if you run a program and it takes you to a certain state, if you were to run that program again, you want it to keep you at that same state. Okay, so um, a simple way to do that, if you're installing a package, it would check if the package is already installed before you run it again, that sort of thing. Uh, or if you're changing the contents of a file, if you were to say these are the entire contents of the file, that would be something that's idempotent as opposed to just appending to the file. So it's something we use. Basically, you can just run your tools over and over again, and the state should be converged. And that's what this la the second word is, convergence. So convergence is when all of the operations that you've requested are in the steady state. So they're all how you want them, all right? Little stuff, maybe it'll come up a little bit. Um, and the last thing I want to mention, which almost no one really thinks about and talks about these days, is something called reversibility. So when I do some operations to take me into a certain desired state, sometimes those operations can have an inverse that takes me back to the state I was at previously. And being able to know which states you can get to and if you can reverse and do all this stuff is really fun. And the reason it's fun is because now we can build these systems that are dynamically changing every second and every minute um, if these operations are all possible. Make sense? OK, more crappy slides. Um, that just shows you that. So some t terminology. Everyone gets these things wrong. Provisioning, configuration management, orchestration, and choreography. Really quickly. Provisioning is everything you do just to turn on the machine. So to boot up the VM, or to provision the iron, or even to set up some image in Amazon. All that stuff is provisioning. Okay? So provisioning is everything happens to turn the machine on. And the last thing provisioning does is it runs a configuration management tool. So that's what that word should mean. And please use it that way. Um, config management is what we're talking about today. Uh, some random notes on the slides. Um, I think that uh, the word configuration management, the term, has been sort of seen as initial step. And it could be used much further than it is today. So configuration management is all the declaration of the desired state. And up until today, we've never really talked about uh, the time component of management as config management. I believe it is. And what that means is config management, for me, should decide what happens every minute of your day. Right? So um, it should say, today I want my service to be up and running. At 5 PM, when people are going home and turning on internet for something, maybe I want the state to change because I want more servers running. So my load balancer should get bigger and so on. All of these things should be part of config management. They have to do with setting up the machine and setting up those states. Cool? Um, a lot of people have sort of, sort of, I think, in my opinion, been stagnant with the current tools. They said, OK, we have Puppet. we have." Uh, you know, Chef and all these tools, but they haven't delivered as much as I wish config management had done. So people are looking to other solutions instead of saying, hey, what else can we do in this space? And I'm biased, of course, but hopefully I can, can uh, convince you. Uh, orchestration. Orchestration is a very specific thing when you have one machine or one entity or one laptop, which is going out and requesting something. So it's um, uh, something like Ansible, for example, is an orchestrator. And it's always a single point, of, it's a, always a single point um, which is going out and, and having that command or series of commands happen. So it's one place of coordination 
um, and always centralized. When you say orchestration, it's always centralized. Even if that centralized point might change, so there might fail over to another server or something if it goes down, that's still orchestration. Are you totally lost, or does this sort of make sense? Wave your hand, say sort of makes sense. All right, you're still alive. That's good. Uh, again, boring slides over in like one minute. Um, and lastly, choreography. I hate this term, but I cannot really think of a better term. And I, if anyone has one, just scream it out or something. But uh, basically, the other way we can uh, automate a lot of things is if each machine or entity or thing or container in the cluster has its own independent algorithm, and they sort of self-organize to work together. Um, a lot of things in real life work this way uh, to a good extent. Fostem, like humans, ants. Uh, algorithms like Raft and Paxos, all of these things are, are effectively choreography. Um, and in some ways, this is cool because you don't need that central point of failure that's going out and requesting that things happen in a certain order. Does that make sense? The downside is sometimes the algorithms to make all this stuff happen uh, can be more complicated. But I think this is the future, and this is where we should be doing stuff. Please, someone find a better term than choreography because I don't know what it is. Uh, really, last thing, topologies. There's different topologies architecturally. And every time I hear of a new tool, this is what I want to know about. If it's a tool that's running on more than one machine, you've got to have this in the documentation. So these are some topologies I'll show you. This one, when you have a whole bunch of clients at the bottom that initiate requests to a server, what's this called? Scream it out. Who's shy? Is anyone really shy? Just raise your hand so I know where you are. Anybody? Yeah. Client server, right? So um, what's the problem with this topology? Anyone? Scream it out. Mm -hmm. Single point of failure. Um, also kind of very traditional, well-known, so it's used. If you look at this one, this is almost the opposite. You have the orchestrator, like I was talking about before, initiating the connection to a whole bunch of machines. Uh, what's the problem with this topology? Scream it out. Don't be shy. Pardon me? Uh, same thing, yeah. It's also a single point of failure. There can be performance limitations. Uh, tools like Ansible do this, right? Who's used Ansible? Who's happy about using Ansible? Just kidding. I'm teasing Red Hat. Don't hurt me. Uh, so there's some other topologies, uh, a full peer-to-peer -peer mesh. Uh, these are actually kind of cool because everyone is talking to everyone else. But the problem with this sort of topology is what? Yeah? Scream it out. Convergence. Uh, convergence can, the algorithms to do convergence can be more complicated. But even simpler than that, uh, when you have a large number of peers, if each peer is talking to every other peer, the number is just too big. So numbers are too big, cannot scale. Um, and there's some weird hybrid topologies, for example, where you have a small inner uh, mesh of hosts all talking together, and they form a cluster, and then um, everyone else joins as a client and talks through one of those machines. This is actually what we do in MGMT. So um, cool. Do you want to see some demos? No more slides. Yes? OK. The demos are a little bit boring, but it's meant as a beginner talk. So we'll do my best. So this is sort of past, present, and future of config management. So I figured we'd dig into the past and see how people used to run stuff. Uh, manual hacking on stuff. This is kind of how I set up my laptop, right? Um, there's some problems with this. Um, and um, it's useful, but it doesn't scale. And if you suck at bash or you suck at remembering what commands to run, this can go poorly. So we have some bash scripting, which is kind of the next thing that sysadmins do. Who's like a sysadmin and has run, written some bash? even basic stuff. I know you're there. You're probably hiding so that I don't find you. But I dug into the old code that I had. And I, um, let me just pull this up. Um, demos. So I even found this old script I wrote. I'll show you really quickly. So this is a script I wrote like over 10 years ago. And basically what it does is it's something I just run from my laptop. And it checks if it's on this local machine. Um, that's bad. So it wants to always run on the server that I'm administering. And if it does that, uh, if, it, if it's not running on the server that I'm administering, it will actually SSH and run itself on that server and then run some command. And what the script really does at the very end is it's just adding a user. And just to make this more fun, so basically I'm going to show all these demos in terms of adding a user. And there's this weird GUI thing that's common called cockpit. And it like, has this stuff that shows you what's going on on the server. I don't really use it, but it's nice because it works in real time also. And it has a list of the users on the machine. So I'm going to keep this in the background just so you can see. And let's run this script. Uh, and let's see what happens. Forget how to run it. Let's see. Oh, that's useful. Um, Fostem. 
talk one. This is a new user. So let's run it. And you can see, boom, it SSH'd into the server and added this user. So the server that I'm talking about in the background, I have this window right here, which is this random FOSTEM 2020 VM that I'm just running because I don't want to run all this junk on my machine. And this is just a view of that server. Does that make sense? Yeah? So that's the past. Like, crappy shell scripts that I wrote or you wrote or that everyone wrote uh, all hacked together. Um, we can do better. Um, I'll actually just show you on the actual server itself. I have a little bash folder. Um, here's a really simple way how people did this. I've sort of distilled everything down. You have a really simple script uh, that's just checking if the user exists, and if it doesn't, it runs it. Why are we doing this? Why are we checking before we add? I think I might have heard it, because we want the thing to be idempotent, right? So if something is wrong, you just run the script, and it should be safe. You could run it many times. So if we run it, um, you can see, think of how long it takes. It's creating the user. Hello. Hi, I'm going to assist you with the microphone. Oh, that's, that's weird. Hello. I have to talk to both people. Well, yeah, just, just into the mic, and then, uh, okay. yeah. They can hear me. All right. So uh, uh, thank you to my mic stand over here. Round of applause. So yeah, I just ran the bash script, and you can see it creates the users, which you all see have added here. But if you run it again, you can see it can go a lot faster because it doesn't have to do the work to add the users. Make sense? Um, well, let's move on. Um, some problems with this. So bash is, is a super kind of weird language. I love writing in bash, but it's a little idiosyncratic and it can be a little problematic. So any code that we can move away from bash, not because it's not awesome, but into safer things, will be good for safety and reliability of infrastructure. Um, here's an old tool that I never used, but if I don't mention it, Steve will murder me because he goes to this conference that I go to. He is one of these early people that worked on this. Uh, basically, it was kind of like a makefile, if you've ever seen a makefile. And the important takeaway is that it was this makefile that would run. And um, what's cool about that is it actually basically has a DAG. So it's showing the dependencies you want to do on your certain machine in a certain order. So it's one of the earliest uses of an actual DAG, this graph data structure that I showed at the beginning, uh, in automation. So definitely before my time. Let's look at CF Engine. Who's heard of CF Engine? I was going to show like a CF Engine version 1 demo, but I figured I wouldn't be too mean. So I have actually here a CF Engine demo. Uh, a little bit, um, a little bit more complicated, just to show you. Same sort of thing. This is how you um, look at the CF Engine code. Here, there's a list of users that I wanted to create. Um, and here's the user's sort of declaration that shows what's going to happen to them. Um, for me, at least, CF Engine is a little bit more complicated to read. And there's a lot of boilerplate and a lot of sort of nuances about the tool that I found very confusing. But just to show you, we can, we can be mean and time all these tools. Just as you can see, the users are starting to get uh, created right now as we watch. Um, it has this whole thing, uh, Mark Burgess, with promise theory, which, to be honest, I don't really understand. I think I understand, but it's uh, a little over my head. But it does the, it does the job, uh, and a lot of people use it. And the newer versions uh, are apparently quite good. Uh, there are some drawbacks. So for me, um, I think that uh, in a modern day tool, we want our tools, if possible, written in memory-safe languages. And if not our tools, at least our code. Um, and it's mostly written in C, which I think is kind of a bit of a barrier going forward. Um, there's some advantages, but also some disadvantages. So something to think about. Um, and if you actually look deep into the CF Engine sort of ethos and philosophy, there's actually some really good design ideas that newer tools have forgotten about entirely. Uh, so hopefully, going forward, we'll actually study the past and not make these mistakes over again. Uh, let's move a little bit more into the future. Uh, Puppet. Someone's probably used Puppet in this room. It was the first mainstream tool that I used uh, past Bash. Um, I don't really know if it's still growing. I think Puppet's kind of like in the danger zone because, in my opinion, maybe this is a bit rude, but I don't think they've been innovating anymore. They've kind of just plateaued and stopped. Um, and they came out with this orchestrator tool called Bolt, which is just an Ansible copy. So I think they need to shake things up because they were so close to what I wanted. Uh, and I was using Puppet for so many years. In particular, the way you describe what you want to have done is with a DSL. So it's this domain-specific language. Um, and um, let's do a little puppet demo. You want to see a puppet demo? Yeah, so here's my little puppet code. Very simple. Um, you have uh, this little user define, and I have three puppet users here that I want to run. 
Oh, and let's just let's be cheeky again. We'll time it just so you can see how long it takes. This was a lot of my life for five years, watching puppet runs go by, hours, days. Um, so, not so bad. We got the job done. We got our three years users created, which was nice. Um, and yeah, that's puppet. Um, it's changed quite a lot over the years. So it didn't used to have uh, types and all these fancy things built in really at the core. So newer versions are a lot safer. But uh, Puppet still makes the mistake that a lot of uh, DSLs do, is it, or a lot of programming languages do rather. They have nulls. So you can have the equivalent of like a null pointer exception in Puppet, um, undefined. And that's a problem because if you have that, you can crash. So safe languages like Haskell and so on don't have these values, so you cannot crash in that same way. And I think if we want to build robust infrastructure, we have to think about using really safe languages, memory safe language, but also type safe languages that, that don't have these problems. These are solved problems. We're just afraid of them. Uh, just some technical things about Puppet. I'm doing this for all the new tools. Um, it's mostly in Ruby and Clojure for the new server. Uh, it has this Puppet DSL. The topology, it's a client server thing. So we saw that at the beginning. Um, and this is kind of a disappointment. It used to be GPL v2. And then they you know, wanted to do the open core thing and moved a lot of it to Apache license, which was, um, I think, kind of a mistake a long time ago. But uh, the biggest thing with Puppet that stood out for me, I didn't realize until I was using it for at least two or three years, Puppet has the Puppet server, and then it has the Puppet agent that runs on all the clients. And they have this strange separation of some code runs on the server, and some code runs on the client, and they go back and forth. And I can explain to you how it works, but it's not clear why this makes sense. Um, I've talked to some Puppet people. They've had some arguments which I didn't really agree with. Uh, but yeah, so it's a little bit strange, and it can be confusing when you're writing code dealing with this stuff. So it's something to think about if you look at Puppet. Chef. Um, Chef basically is like kind of a fork of Puppet. Uh, Puppet, uh, the Chef people didn't want a DSL. They wanted pure Ruby code, um, effectively. And so uh, let's see. You want to see some Chef? Anybody? Do you want to see some Chef? Yeah. All right, cool. Why not? Uh, so uh, here's some Chef. And here's, I'll just show you this in Vim so you can see a little bit nicer. So here's the Ruby code. Um, and watch here, I'm doing this puts, which is basically printf in Ruby. I'm doing one at the start, one at the end, down here. And in the middle, I have all these, these uh, user declarations. OK? And watch what happens when I run the code. And I'll just, so we'll run the code. It's running, oh, let's, uh, oh, I'm going to kill it. Ah, I'm going to kill it and time it. Well, I forgot to time it, sorry. So it already did a bit of work, so we'll deduct a few seconds. So look, look right here. Here's the put. These are my two messages that happen all at the start, and then the users get created. So Ruby, the way it works, it's kind of a little strange, but what's actually happening is all the code runs, and then during the running, these statements, um, these resources get evaluated and stored somewhere. And then at the end, it collects them all and then applies them. So it's kind of like a two-stage thing. If you've ever done Vagrant and written code in a Vagrant file, it works the same way. It's very common for Ruby DSLs. But I think this is super confusing. Because if you think about coding, you have to think in terms of the code execution and then the evaluation at the end, um, which is super, super confusing. And the bad thing is you have this full imperative language, which I think is quite dangerous. So if you make an off by one error and you blow away a data center, that could be bad, right? So we're getting into the modern era where things should be safe and reliable. And so that's one of my big problems with um, Chef. Um, I don't know what's been happening. Like, all my Chef friends stopped using Chef when they started doing the like, US prisons thing or something. I don't know what's going on. Uh, but there's a lot of good people and smart people at Chef. Um, and that's what it looks like. So uh, yeah, random Chef. Uh, some random technical things. It's implemented in Ruby. It has this Ruby DSL uh, using Ruby code with uh, the special resources. It also has a client server topology. All these demos, I'm not running the Chef server and the Puppet server. I'm just running them in standalone so you can see quickly. Um, it's Apache licensed as everything these days. Um, and the, the thing that I'm sort of disappointed about is even though it has full Ruby language, it hasn't delivered on building fully autonomous systems. Right? So I don't know that this proved that having a full programming language is really the missing piece in config management. Does that make sense? That's just my opinion. Um, so Ansible, everyone's favorite. I saw it. We got the fanboy up in the front. Um, I, 
was really shocked how popular Ansible got so quickly. Um, I used to work at this company called Red Hat, and during that time they acquired Ansible, and that was a big surprise. Um, there are some problems with Ansible. It's great for small things, but topologically, it's got this design architecture where you have that orchestrator that's going out and doing stuff. So I've seen customers with 50 hosts or 100 hosts, and they're hitting like really big walls. Um, it's very slow. Python stuff isn't, isn't very fast. Um, algorithmically, every time it runs, it has to recheck everything, so that's also very slow. So it's great and useful for small things, but I think in the longer term, without some clever building of your Ansible setup, um, it's not really scaling. And that's the problem. We shouldn't have to be clever to do all these things. We want our tools to help us. We don't want to be working around our tools. Um, and the thing that's absurd for me is this YAML thing. I just, I'm not that in love with YAML that I want to be writing this every day. Um, and fun fact, actually, the YAML thing was a total accident. From what I heard, I was talking to someone, and basically, uh, the YAML front end was just temporary, and it was meant to be replaced by language. But that's a lot of work, and it just never happened, and it stuck. So who knows? But nevertheless, do you want to see an Ansible demo? Do you want to see an Ansible demo? Yeah. All right, thank you. I'm trying to make this a little bit entertaining, because it's a little bit of the same. So uh, kind of simple here. Here's a little user's file. It's a, it's a, a YAML file with a list of users to create. Not anything revolutionary. And if we run it, I forgot to time it. The cow is creating users. I have time to sip some water. I mean, you can tell it's not super fast. And even if I run it again, it'll go a bit faster. But even with the users all created, it uh, takes some time. If we actually want to, here, we can actually time it. We can just delete all the old users. And you can see them disappearing on the left. And if we run it, you can see. I like the cow. Cow say is kind of one of my favorite things. So you get points for that. But um, imagine when you're doing big, complicated things over SSH, too many machines. You can see it takes quite a lot of time to create three users, right? Am I crazy, or is this a little slow? I'm not crazy. Thank you. So um, pardon me? Uh, the hecklers, you've got to be louder if you're going to heckle. Uh, anyway, so yeah, but the, it's incredibly popular. It's incredibly useful. And for simple things, I still think it's a really good solution. So um, just think about it. Because sometimes you get invested in the simple solution, and it gets much bigger. And then over time, um, things get a little bit complicated. Uh, Technical-wise, implementing Python, uh, as you might know, this YAML interface is not exactly what I want. It's a central orchestrator. It's also a config management tool. Uh, it's GPLv3, which is super funny, because for some reason, when they released Ansible Tower source code, they decided, for some unknown reason, to pick uh, the Apache license, instead of keeping the same license for some reason. So something funny is going on at Red Hat with the legal department. You'll have to find out why they chose that oh, different license. Um, and I told you about the AML front end. Uh, Docker. Do you want to hear about Docker? Is Docker a config management tool? No, it's not. Uh, don't be misled. So when Docker started, started getting popular, uh, people were always saying, OK, this is what's going to replace config management. And that's just like the biggest lie. Um, it's not. It's a different technology. Stop thinking of it as the same technology. And the saddest thing is that for configuring your Docker images and your Docker containers, how do you do it? Shell scripts, right? It's sort of like going back to the very beginning, we were like, OK, we shouldn't use shell scripts to define our infrastructure. Oh, now we have Docker, so we're going to start using shell scripts again. Um, so your best bet is to basically not use Docker or use like a tool like Puppet or Chef to build the images or something else. Um, it's just kind of absurd. Um, and uh, I just, like, the Docker project is this huge, enormous, sprawling, giant mess of things, which is just, um, I just think, it's just over-engineered and in all the wrong places. Uh, if you are into the container things, I'm not anti-container. There's this lovely project called System the Nspawn, uh, which is just light and works and integrates and does cgroups and all the magic. Uh, it's part of the system D project, which is a good thing, because uh, they do great work. And so check it out. But I'm here to give you a Docker demo. And so I'll just show you how it works. Um, I had to run it last night to get everything cached. So if I just show you in here, I have the Docker file. Really simple thing. These sort of verbs 
And each one of these becomes like a layer in the file system image, which is kind of strange. A big problem with this is if you build this image, and one of these is this update command, you'll never know when that command is stale. So it will never know to re-update things that were once re-updated. You know what I mean? So basically, if you create this, if you run this, it will build this. It'll say, this hasn't changed. Therefore, below it, I don't rerun any of the old commands. Uh, same thing, this doesn't change. This command runs once. It never knows that it's stale, so it will never re-update it. So to work around these things, there's all sorts of hacks and variable names and modified time stuff. But it's, it's the whole design of the Docker file, for me, does not excite me. So, but um, I built this last night, and I can show you how it works. You basically build it like this, which I did. Um, it took quite a while last night, but it's done now, so it's idempotent and it doesn't rebuild it. And then to run it, we'll just uh, run it over here. And you can see now you're inside this container, and you can do stuff like, uh, you know, I don't know, opt. I don't really trust Docker to not delete my machine, so I won't like break it too much. But if you kill it, and then you go back in, um, huh? There's opt is back. Hmm. So yeah, it, you have to basically build stateless applications, which is actually a good thing. But architecturally, a lot of people, software applications aren't really ready for this environment. So there's some challenges. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Some quick technical things. It's implemented in Golang. Uh, I actually like the language a lot. I don't like the way the project is run all the time, and I don't like the tools around Golang. But Golang itself is a lovely language, uh, as long as they don't add generics. Um, it has this really poor interface for describing what you want and how you build your containers. I don't think this is how it should be done, but they're so popular. Um, it's not a config management tool. What is it? Yes? What kind of tool is it? Remember those boring slides at the beginning? Somebody? Provisioning tool, right. So it's what gets you um, the base thing running so that you can run config management to build your image and everything that runs inside it. Uh, also Apache license, big surprise. Um, and one good thing is it actually helped make containers mainstream again. So I think there's some potential there. Uh, quick thing on Kubernetes, because everyone is, it's not a config management tool. What is it? It's an orchestrator, yeah. Um, it cannot replace config management. That's completely false. Uh, there's no really easy way to bootstrap the etcd cluster and uh, put it into production. It's like uh, one of these unsolved problems that they just say, oh, uh, we don't know how to do this, so run it in Google Cloud or Amazon. Um, and just thinking about infrastructure and real-time systems and everything that happens, the YAML front end just doesn't do it for me. Like, it's not a proper way to describe everything. So there's other solutions like Helm and Q and all these other tools to add on top of it to make it more sensible, but it hasn't really um, done it for me. Implement in Golang again, YAML format, orchestrator, as we said. It has this evil Google CLA, so you should not send them patches. Um, and the paper that it's all based on, if you actually read the board paper, there's very little details and very little information in that. So the whole design premise, I, they tried to convince everyone, uh, didn't really convince me. Uh, do you want to see a demo? Just kidding. I am not giving you a demo. Uh, I've, uh, there's recorded demos. I've given talks in the past where I did some Kumo, some Cube stuff. So if you really want to see some, some basics, uh, look on my website. But I'm not even installing this in my VM. Save yourself. Use something different. Uh, let's look at the future. So this is where I'm super biased, okay? because I'm working on a tool that I think is part of the future. But I want you to decide and tell me what you think. So these are some of the things I want in a tool. I want it to be safe, uh, powerful, reactive, easy to reason about, and so on. So you want to see a demo? OK, so here's some code. It's hard to see. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit fast because I lost five minutes at the beginning. But uh, let's just kill this for now. So over here, we have our little MGMT thing again. Um, this is date time. So I'm going to run MGMT on the left. And I'm just going to show you this code first. Okay, So this is the code. Um, the syntax highlighting isn't something that I have yet, so I'm sorry for that. But basically, if you can see, there's different statements. Uh, there's different expressions. So there's this datetime.now function, which we're adding to this variable a year, which is over here. And then we put all these values in a struct along with the load. And then all those variables um, go into this big template at the bottom, which we're going to print out. So let's run this on the left. That left. Uh oh. Um, 
Oh, my, what's going on? This my... Uh oh. It's kind of my dev environment, and there's a bug that I'm still killing. Let's see if this can work. Oh. This is my. Uh, one second. I gotta use the different version. One second. Uh, releases. One second. Sorry about that. Okay. So my password is password. If anyone wants to use my laptop. Uh, these packages are all online, so you can try them out. This should work a bit better. There we go. Let's see how that. Oh, all oh, right. Uh, one second. And okay. Let's run this demo. Okay. So MGMT is running on the left. And over here, I've told it to create this one file, date time. And if you see, it's got a whole bunch of text in it. But if I watch dash n01, just to show you what's happening in real time in the file, you can see that date time function is actually reevaluating every second in that small amount of DSL code. And if it does that, it can change the file because it sees what has to be updated and so on. And you can see I'm printing out the time. Um, which is number of time in seconds. And also other things like the load, which I'm also printing out, are showing in real time as well. And the last thing, just for fun, is kind of a bit of a, a joke demo. If you see, if I make noise, you can see this VU meter is going up and down. Because one of the inputs into my language is the actual microphone in my laptop. And so what this is, is giving you a DSL. It's this reactive DSL. It's a special kind of language uh, that knows when to update things based on real time streams, integrates all those streams, and output something that um, can change over time. So this is the kind of thing you can imagine if the load is going up in your system. Um, you might want to spin up some new VMs or shut down something else or so on as it changes. Does that make sense? This is kind of how we want to model things in the future. Um, I'll show you one more demo. Um, I'm going to show you actually one more cool demo if I have time. Um, so. I'm going to run uh, this. Oops. Um, right. I have to kill this one first. OK. So I'm running MGMT on the left. And, oops. And MGMT has actually started up this VM for me. I'm going to use my dev environment, so let's see if this works. So I've uh, started up MGMT on the left, and over here I'm logging into the VM that MGMT has started up. And I'll just run screen. And inside the VM, normally when you boot up the VM, when it's provisioned, you would run MGMT automatically. But in this case, I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like so you actually can see MGMT running. And the second thing I'm going to do is going to run this display CPUs script. And this just shows me in real time how many CPUs, virtual CPUs, are in the VM. Oh. Now, the code that's running here is this. So what it does is it looks at this file that's on my hard drive, temp CPU count. It pulls out an integer. And then what it does is it has this virtual machine resource, and it puts that number of CPUs into the VM resource. And what that does is if I go here, Sorry about all the windows. And I echo 2 into that um, file. When I press Enter, in theory, MGMT is going to notice that the file changed. It's going to suck in that new value. It's going to notice that the running VM has a different number of CPUs. It's going to take that value. It's going to hot plug a, a CPU. And then inside um, this file, MGMT is going to see that. It's going to let the VM be online. It's going to show you the new value of two CPUs. So let's see if it works. 
Uh, it takes a moment the first time because it's uh, my hard drive is kind of slow, and then you can see it has two. And if you go to something like three, you can see it happens in under a second, right? You can go up to five, you can go back down to one, and you can even show off a little bit, like with this little script I made. Um, and as you go plus and minus, you can see MGMT is reacting in real time, making everything work. So I've done this demo kind of quickly because I don't have a lot of time and they took away some time at the minute, but after. Um, this is sort of the idea. So if you start building infrastructure that is, is working in real time, we can do all these fancy things. We can change our loads and move things around as things go. Does that make sense? Um, I'm sorry I didn't have longer to explain that, but I don't have a lot of time and there's some good news. So these are sort of some of the fun things we can do in MGMT. Um, how can you help? Just to finish off, um, you can use this, you can test it, patch it, share it, document it, star it, blog it, tweet it, if you have Twitter, uh, discuss it with your friends, just hack on this stuff. Um, I am working on this basically on my own dime just because I wanted to work on this for a bit and see if I could turn it into something that sustained itself. So it's totally unfunded. So if you want to help fund it, uh, I think the number is lower now, but uh, I'm on Patreon and funny hacker is very sexy. So. Check it out. The other thing I'm trying to do, I basically I think I'm going to be ready for full production use in the next six months or so. I'm starting using it. I'm using it on my own servers now to sort of set up and manage things, stuff like that. And I had the idea of doing some corporate sponsorship. So we're launching a website. And if you want to have your logo at the bottom for a very cheap amount of money per year, contact me and let me know. Uh, that would be good. Let's just recap. You can't hear the audio, but that's Arthur Benjamin saying he's putting the cap back on his pen. Recapping. Uh, there's an IRC channel if you're on IRC. I'm not on Slack. Sorry, everyone. Uh, there's a Twitter account and a mailing list, uh, which is still hosted by my old employer. So thank you, old employer. Um, the technical blog of James you all know about, so you can go check it out. Uh, you can find me, Purple Idea. I go by Purple Idea on IRC, on Twitter, and you can even write me an email. Um, if you want a more in-depth technical talk about MGMT, you're in luck because today at 5.30 in the infra room, um, it will probably be busy. So if you want to actually come, come early for a seat, I'll show some demos that no one has seen before uh, and we'll really get in-depth without going quickly over all the tools. And tomorrow in the minimal languages room, I'm going to give a more uh, FRP languages talk uh, for those people. And if you come to Ghent for config management camp, I see Chris is in the back of the room. He runs a great conference. There's going to be uh, one talk that I'm giving there and two talks for some other people. Um, last thing before you leave, sorry, one minute. Um, if you like this talk, please come up to the organizers and shake them and say, please, uh, I want you to know James's talk was amazing. And you can even go to the feedback form. If you click on the talk, there's a submit feedback link. So please give me a good rating. It would be appreciated. Um, and if you want, I have a sticker. If you promise to use your sticker, uh, come over and I'll give you one for your laptops. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh